So welcome to the Dealing with Triggering webinar. So I'd like to point a couple of things out. I offer sex and relationships guidance to men and women, typically through three or six month packages which give a great opportunity for some substantial personal transformation. And if you have any questions during the talk, uh, just pop them up uh, in the chat box. Uh, you'll probably find a little chat button somewhere in one of your windows and you can click that and the dialogue will pop up and you can talk to me. So why do we do this work? Well, I'm, I'm hoping to help people build ecstatic relationships, really good, really deep, and really pleasant and intimate experiences with their loved ones. And also, of course, we'd like to avoid uh, heartbreak and, and uh, difficult feelings that can arise from uh, bad relationships. And it's because we'd like to be seen in these relationships and not trapped in them. And we'd like to be more present in the moment. So we're having a more real time relationship. And we'd like our relationships to be deep and authentic. So they're really about us and not uh, prior problems and issues we've had that um, kind of can dominate relationships when they're not dealt with. And it's also an opportunity to sort of discover more about yourself and remake yourself. Oh, this is this process of, of becoming more authentic. And the bigger, the bigger thing, uh, the gain that uh, hopefully we can get out of this is to actually make the whole world better. So we all become better at relating, we all connect better, um, and we have more opportunity with, for, for love and for a peaceful world. So what's, what's a trigger? Um, well, a, a trigger is something that sets off a memory tape or, or a flashback, transporting you to an event uh, in the past where you experienced the original trauma. And I think, I think trigger's a great word for that. And what, what tends to cause this uh, triggering? It's usually a familiar situation plus some other sensory data. So this could be uh, typically a sight or a sound, um, or it could be uh, less likely to be a touch or a smell. And then finally, it might even be a taste. Uh, so any of these things put together uh, can create a trigger, and then the person gets this sort of flashback. And this the flashback may not be like a visual thing, um, like you might get with, with uh, taking uh, drugs or something like that. It, it, it may not be like a hallucination or, or visual, um, but the flashback can be in the body or in the mind or words might come back to you. So we mean flashback in a sort of a more general sense. And I wanted to put a bit of a disclaimer on this uh, particular webinar as well. Um, some people have had traumatic experiences that are, are um, uh, quite um, deeply uh, are damaging to their to their personality, um, and they have have uh, very bad wounding to their to their psyche. Um, and and these people. Uh, could, could require medical attention. So I'm not providing that. Um, so it's just a little bit of a disclaimer there. Um, so really um, what I'm about to tell you is, is for people who perhaps are just struggling a bit in relationships and they, they don't have any huge issues that, that uh, 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 like for example, post-traumatic stress disorder, somebody that's been in the military, um, that, that really needs some kind of... of um, more expert advice and, and hands-on uh, uh, treatment. 
But nevertheless, uh, most of us have experienced trauma, both physical and emotional, uh, typically as, as children, and this includes things like smacking, bullying, name-calling, uh, harsh criticism, gaslighting, bit of a technical word, if, if um, one of your carers, one of your parents was, uh, was sociopathic or narcissistic, then it's possible that they've engaged in quite a long uh, or prolonged um, series of, of attacks on your personality uh, to, to sort of break you and, and manipulate you and make you more controllable. And this can really be very, very confusing uh, to you uh, as your personality develops. And, and neglect as well uh, can also lead to trauma. Now, I mentioned things like post-traumatic stress disorder and other more serious uh, examples of trauma, rape, for example, um, that, that, that will probably require some professional help. Um, but for, for a lot of the things that I just mentioned, um, it may not be so serious that, that you need that kind of help, uh, but it, it, then it becomes insidious. So you, you may not be aware um, that you have have this trauma uh, because you're kind of just getting on with life and it's it feels kind of normal um, so you know you don't have all these extreme reactions but nevertheless um, you'll still have these overwhelming emotions um, that, that prevent you from coping well in in the trigger situation um, and, it, and some people will will just be unaware of this uh, going on really um, I mean, they'll experience it, but they, they won't really have any sort of conscious um, uh, way of, 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 of processing it. So it will just sort of happen like a, completely like an autopilot. Um, and if they're challenged on this and made aware of it, uh, then it's possible they'll go into denial of some kind. They'll say, oh, well, it's normal. You know, my parents did this all the time. Uh, you know, everybody's relationships are like this. Um, and it's just not true. Uh, I've never had a row with my current partner, been with her many years, and we have a very peaceful and cooperative relationship, um, and this, this makes us both feel very safe. And, and so um, these, these old stories really aren't, aren't true at all. And there's certainly work we can do to, to improve things um, in, when relationships are challenging. So... Uh, another quote uh, from Diane Renz here, um, and I will read this uh, straight out. When we are triggered emotionally, it can all feel sort of choiceless, like we've lost control of ourselves. Even if we have the awareness of our reaction, it is difficult to stop our emotional response because the nervous system, the brain, the memory centers are all interacting. Uh, so like I said before, it's almost like a possession that comes over you um, and you're not able to, to rationally sort of control what you're doing. And there's a reason for this, um, why we're not really present in the moment. It's because we've gone into a reaction in our, our primitive brain. And because the primitive brain is all about fight or flight, um, we can end up treating people a bit like enemies. So um, we might like withdraw and run away from our, our loved one, um, or we might sort of fight them. We might get into a, a, a verbal or possibly even a, a physical um, kind of situation with them. And of course, this is really challenging and, and possibly very disastrous for a, uh, an intimate relationship. Because um, intimate relationships need us to be able to be in responsive behavior rather than in reactive behavior. And responsiveness means we're, we're in control of our behavior and, and aware of what's going on. So what can we do to manage triggering? Um, this, this is, these are really coping strategies. So we can avoid... Uh, and, and thereby stay away from the trigger situation. Now, sometimes this uh, might be absolutely necessary to do um, if the triggering it, it is very unmanageable or disturbing to your life. Uh, sometimes it's not practical and sometimes it's not desirable either because you end up not actually working through and resolving the problem. The other one, another one is to contain 
uh, the issue. That's to sort of um, try and, and uh, minimize it and, and keep it manageable uh, so it doesn't go to sort of a, uh, the explosive uh, escalation stage. And commitment in relationship can be really helpful as well. A lot of triggering uh, comes from uncertainty or doubts or fears about the status of the relationship. Um, so that's, that's really another approach to containing, but a slightly different one. Um, and you can do that by clarifying what you want to give. And also empathy is really helpful as well, empathizing uh, with the person that's been triggered, um, uh, the person who's been triggered empathizing with themselves, uh, and there's, there's approaches uh, to facilitate uh, uh, this process. But finally, is sort of the, the big one, uh, is to re rewrite the reactive style of re relating. So we actually um, really become present in the moment, and we, we use these different techniques uh, to, to actually rewrite the way our brain processes the trigger situation. And that takes the situation from a win-lose one, because, it's, because the uh, fight or flight always has it like a winner and a loser, to a win-win situation. So uh, both people involved uh, learn something new about each other and, and uh, step up and advance in the relationship and gain more intimacy. So let's go through some of these. Um, avoidance, staying away from the trigger situations. So that might mean not going to certain places or not doing certain things. It may even mean leaving unsuitable partners or taking a break from them. Um, and obviously you need to really think deeply about these kinds of things. It could mean deferring if you've had, uh, which means uh, leaving your family of origin. Uh, say you've had a very abusive mother or father um, and every time you see them, they do something that triggers you. Um, and then after that, say you lose a, a few days sleep or something like this, or you're excruciatingly ang ang anxious, uh, then you might need to, you know, take a break from that person for a while. And, you know, you can explain these things and talk about, say, look, I just, I can't cope with this relationship. Um, I need to, to take a break. Um, so, you know, those are quite, obviously quite dramatic uh, approaches and of course you can always ask people not to do certain behaviors if there's something that they're doing that that sets you off um, it's perfectly reasonable to go and ask and say hey could you could you not do that please um, but you know it depends on the situation they may disagree and say well no I need to be doing that blah 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 so there's there's room for negotiation there um, or you can ask them to warn you about it and then you can you can step back and, and uh, get out of the situation. Of course, all these are coping strategies and, and don't really offer you any healing, but they might give you the space uh, to, to be able to, to work on yourself um, and feel safe. And that, that's, that's important. Containment. So uh, when you start relationships with people, um, and it's, it's harder to introduce these kind of things later, but it could be done, um, you can create agreements with your partner. You can say, uh, um, let's agree not to shout, to call names, let's agree not to be sarcastic or deprecative, and let's agree not to be passive aggressive. So um, we'll, straight away we'll put off the table uh, things that are very likely to cause triggering and escalation. And, and really, I mean, I with my partner and, and our relationship, um, we have this agreement in place. Um, and as we see later, this, this can really help. Um, although that's a sort of containment strategy. It can help you to step up to the next level. And also we can agree to practice accountability and ownership. So for example, if you have these boundaries in place, uh, not to shout and somebody shouts then you can practice um, holding them account and say hey you know you we agreed that we wouldn't do shouting and you've shouted um, and, and then you can see if if the person's uh, prepared to, to own what they did and you know apologize and, and agree uh, to try harder not to do it and so on and so forth uh, but again um, this is these, these are coping strategies Commitment. So commitment uh, can really help in relationships. And that doesn't mean forever or, you know, you've got to get married or something. Um, but in, get, having some idea of what's going to happen in the long term can really be uh, helpful um, in, in, in 
creating uh, a more sense of security and an ability to be intimate and share. It's a, sort of the bricks of, of the relationship. Um, so you might be signing up for life and, and doing the marriage thing. Um, or it might be a, a more looser agreement that, um, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to support you uh, as long as we respect each other and, and things stay good. Or you might have a more casual relationship um, which, where you just say, well, look, I'm here if you need me um, and I'm committed to, to being here always if you need me. So, you know, just emphasizing the commitment doesn't have to be for, for uh, debtors to part. Um, you can define your own level of commitment and be clear about it, and that really helps. And also, in your daily life, there's kind of cement uh, that, that, that helps to, to show that you're doing the commitment and hold it together um, by, by staying engaged with your partner and you know, showing interest in them and supporting them on a regular basis. Um, but also uh, for yourself as well, staying autonomous, uh, and, and meeting your own needs uh, and looking after yourself. Uh, that's, you know, your commitment to yourself. And also uh, by staying aware of, of enmeshment, you know, where you're doing too much for your partner, where you're taking up, trying to take ownership of what they're doing or what their responsibilities are. Um, and also staying aware of, of any way that you become disengaged because that that's going to undermine the commitment that you've made. So, you, you know, staying present and, and uh, involving yourself with the relationship instead of uh, sort of running away. And again, coping strategies. And finally, uh, the empathy idea, um, looking after your own needs, rest, uh, uh, keeping your diet healthy, um, keeping active and fit. These are all things that help to keep us out of stress. And of course, when people get very stressed, they're much more likely to escalate uh, in their um, emotional responses when they're triggered. So, you know, looking after yourself really well is, is important. Um, ask, for, ask for help uh, with, with meeting your needs. Uh, so, you know, often when we're triggered or we're, we're feeling stressed, you know, obviously there's a need there um, and it's, it's helpful to be in touch with that and to give yourself permission to meet that need. And if you need help with it, uh, then, then you can ask your, your partner, your loved one, whoever, um, for a bit of help and see what happens. And the other way around, you know, if your partner's triggered and you can see um, there's something you've done or something that's happened that set them off, then you can offer support and, and you can, uh, can sympathize with them and, you know, be, be nice to them and say, hey, they, you know, that's horrible, sorry, that's happened, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, yeah, there's this um, technique which is really great. Uh, in fact, it's a set of techniques called nonviolent communication or compassionate communication. Uh, which is a, a, a very powerful structure for rewriting the way that you re relate to people, um, using mutual language, uh, expressing your needs, and uh, communicating in ways that are, are not hurtful. And again, these are coping strategies, but the MVC is, is a powerful one and can help with recovery. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, rewriting the reactive style of relating. So um, when we're triggered uh, into this sort of reactive behavior, um, what's happening is we, we, we sort of transform from a being controlled by our, our cortex or our sort of higher brain into the limbic system and, and the more primitive brain functions. Um, and these, these control things like the fight or flight response. And so we experience this uh, very, very real disconnect uh, when we're triggered. Um, and so the way to undo this is, is to reconnect these parts of our uh, neuro, neural pathways, our, our neurobiology. And we do this, um, I think, quite effectively through practicing body awareness. And what we're trying to do is basically resist these reactions. So what I mentioned before about things like having boundaries uh, to not shout and stuff like that, that, that helps not to resist. And when we have things like the NVC 
um, we have and we know we have tools available to to do more compassionate relating all these things help us to be effective in resisting uh, the uh, going into the trigger state and eventually over time what can happen is that uh, this practicing this resistance reinforms uh, our emotions and it and then that reinforms our perceptions so we start to sort of rewrite our reactive uh, process into a more responsive process and it, it can take a while to integrate this um, so let's let's just go into that a little bit more so how do we develop and practice body awareness well it, it, it's a real-time thing it starts um, in the moment when you're having the feelings so it, it begins when we really start to notice what these feelings are you know oh I've been triggered I'm feeling a shortness of breath I'm feeling like I'm having a hot flush uh, I'm feeling like time has slowed down so we're noticing these things going on in the body and with our sense of uh, perceptions and then it's helpful in real time again to describe them and actually to say those things to ourselves to our partners and and say what the emotions are that are coming up or oh, I'm feeling a shortness of breath um, oh um, I'm I'm feeling anxious and then ah uh, oh, now I'm feeling angry so this helps um, the people that are around us to understand what's going on. And of course it helps ourselves to understand what's going on. And this, this is part of the sort of the reinforming process. Um, and also there's a sort of a bigger picture around this as well of avoiding desensitizing your body because you, you really need to, to have these in body experiences um, and know what's going on and connect with them. So uh, there's things to avoid, like using, um, which means drinks and drugs, or, or overeating, um, you know, binge eating, uh, treating yourself. Often these are sort of um, ways that we sabotage having our feelings. So um, you know, we we adopt behaviours which block us from actually recovering from whatever this trauma or damage was, and 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 the consequences. Uh, that we've been left with. And then there's, there's sort of more subtle forms of, of being out of your body than, than like actively uh, drugging or drinking or whatever. Uh, things like sh overstressing, uh, working too much, exercising too much, all things that really uh, uh, decrease the energy that we have available uh, to do feelings. And uh, things to help um, as well, uh, like meditating regularly or, or some form of, of, of maybe uh, self-hypnosis or something like that. And also, uh, you know, if the triggering is more profound and, and you struggle to deal with it in the moment and it's quite a difficult one, then there's things like writing about your experience and, and you know, writing them down, recording them, uh, maybe sharing them with somebody that you really trust and that, that will help you to work through whatever's going on. So again, towards the end of my, my talking bit, and uh, I'd love to include you um, in these next two exercises. So if you have a pen and paper, um, or maybe a note on your computer open, or your PDA or whatever, um, I'll just give you a minute to read uh, this little story out here. Jane feels abandoned whenever her partner spends too much time on Facebook. Then she gets angry and harshly criticizes her partner. So um, just have a, a little think about that, uh, process that. And I just have some questions. Um, this is, <laughs> these are the easy ones, really. The next, the next set will be a bit more challenging. Is this Jane's problem? Should Jane ignore her, her feeling abandoned? Should Jane's partner use Facebook less? What has to change? So um, 
just take a minute to think about that and maybe write something down. And I've put down a few of my own answers to these. So is this Jane's problem? Well, no, it's a relationship problem. It's affecting uh, at least two people. Um, but it does look like it's, it's Jane's problem. Um, she's the one experiencing the abandonment and, you know, looking at Facebook a lot isn't abusive, could be neglectful. Um, but on the face of it, uh, it looks like Jane's problem and she needs to own it. Should Jane ignore her feeling abandoned? No, of course not. Um, there's no way she's going to recover or get through this stuff uh, by ignoring her feelings. So she needs to have her feelings and express them safely. And so, um, as I've mentioned before, um, this is this uh, process of becoming more aware of what's going on in the body and all the things that support that. Um, and there's things like NVC and, and ways of learning to express safely uh, what's going on for you and, and actually turning this around in, into an opportunity um, to learn something about each other and to move into something deeper. Should Jane's partner use Facebook less? Well, this, this really, these kind of things are really are negotiable um, and you do need skills, uh, negoti negotiating skills to deal with this kind of thing. Um, so you just need to discuss and make agreements around this. I mean, you know, obviously if the Facebooking is, is hours per day um, and uh, you're not having much time to connect with your partner and do something nice with them, then that, that's probably a neglectful um, and there's, there's this, there is a genuine abandonment there. Uh, and and uh, so it might, be, it, it might be in that situation, it's quite reasonable that you feel abandoned. So you need to be able to separate um, those situations where the, the trigger is, is um, perhaps has a reasonable amount of, of, of uh, expectation behind it from that which is, is purely a, a uh, historical uh, process just based on the trauma in the past and what the person's doing is actually, you know, like an everyday kind of normal thing and, and isn't abusive, isn't neglectful. Um, it's actually okay. It's objectively, when you look at it, reasonably, rationally, an okay thing. Um, then you can, you know, you can come up with some kind of, of, of agreement um, around it. And, you know, it might be quite nice um, in any case and essential <laughs> perhaps to, to have some kind of agreement in place and how much time you do these kind of things for. So um, you're clear around it. So what has to change? Well, what about avoidance? Um, hmm. Should Jane's partner avoid using Facebook? No, I don't think so. We've got the uh, negotiating thing there. Uh, again, as I said, um, it's up to you to, to, to come up with the agreements around that and what you think are reasonable expectations. Uh, boundaries. Well, yes, that's that's something here. There's potential for that. Um, there was some harsh criticism, so uh, there should be a boundary around that, in my opinion. Uh, criticism should be constructive and helpful. Uh, that way, we will grow. Commitment. Well, yes, we could we could engage a bit more of a commitment there. We could commit to uh, Jane having more time with her partner, so she doesn't feel abandoned. Um, get get the partner to to commit to that. Uh, empathy. Um, well, of course, uh, if you're harshly criticising somebody, that shows a lack of empathy. Um, so, as we said, we have the boundaries in place, and uh, that and that can help to prevent that. Um, also, the partner can have more empathy and say, "Hey, you're you know you're feeling, you, you uh, how, why are you reacting like this? Um, why are you why are you having these difficult feelings?" And then there's or well, maybe you can go into the story. Oh, well, you know, uh, Jane says, well, uh, you know, my father um, and mother divorced and uh, he left and I never heard from him again. And uh, that made, uh, I feel really, that was re really a lonely experience that I had after that. So again, this is process through empathizing with each other, which allows for, for growth and, and uh, allows you to um, integrate the experience and, and rather than sort of suppressing it and, and forgetting it. And yeah, we can, we can, we can get involved in this recovery process of, of using uh, the awareness of the body 
um, to integrate these past experiences. So those are my answers. Um, let's have a look at something a little bit more personal, just to sort of wind up uh, dealing with triggering. Uh, so again, if you have your paper and pencils ready, your notepads, etc. What situations trigger you? So what makes you angry? What makes you upset? What makes you panic? How do you feel in your body when these things happen? Do you feel short of breath? Do you feel numb? Do you feel hot? Do you feel shaky? So physical feelings. And when you get these feelings, what are the associated emotions? Does some anger come up for you? Resentment? Fear? How do you react? Do you shout? Do you hit? Do you run away? Do you write a stinking email? Do you call your friend and have a rage about what happened? And then how would you like to respond? What would you like to happen instead of that reaction process? Um, maybe underneath this, there's a need as well. So identify, identify that need. What are, what are the needs? What's missing in that situation? What would make you feel better? And the last question, who can help you? Is there somebody, is your, can your partner help you? Can you help you? Uh, is it a bit too big? Do you need to see a psychotherapist? So always something to be considered. Uh, there, that's an option too. So that's pretty much it for dealing with triggering. And we're on into questions and answers. And hopefully the uh, questions I've asked you have, have stimulated some some uh, ideas for you.